Come explore our world of coffee. Deluna Coffee was founded in 2014 by Ed and Courtney Lemmicks alongside their son, Brett. The Lemmickses are Pensacola natives with a passion for coffee, so what better than their Beechin blend, which is just that, Beechin. It's their classic combination of Colombian and Brazilian beans. It creates a superior French roasted coffee taste, lower in caffeine, so it'll keep you easy breezy. Ed and Brett are both FSU alums and are extending a special offer to our listeners. Use the promo code WORDCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit thelunacoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram. From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up, wake up, wake up. WarChant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up WarChant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Coffee's for closers only. Now here's WarChant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up. What's up, everybody? It's Wake Up WarChant, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. DeLuna Coffee, come explore our world of coffee. Promo code WarChant15. Use it. Um, I'm sure Corey has a really cool story about hanging out with Ed Lemmix at the Pensacola, Greater Pensacola kickoff party, but we're recording this beforehand. So I was thinking, Corey, probably should have done this show with you and Jeff on speakerphone on your way back from Pensacola. That might have been a more entertaining show, but maybe next year. Next year, buddy. Next year, man. Yeah. Warchant.com, your ultimate symbol sports source. Promo code Warchant30. Use it. Maybe even go to the YouTube page, subscribe to that one. That's totally free. Uh, hit the thumbs up button, distributes the video, pushes it out to the masses, uh, helps build this thing that we're doing. It's a, it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. We're going to do a little bit of a somewhat of a Renegade Express. Corey, I, I totally dropped the ball and didn't post the thread until Thursday afternoon, and we're recording this on a Thursday afternoon. So uh, shout out to the folks that got in there, though. Otherwise, how are you, Corey? You all right? You ready to go slay it? Uh, or should we talk in the past sense about how great of a job you did? Because I'm sure you probably did a fantastic job in Pensacola. I don't want to jinx it. Uh, so we'll be transparent. We'll let people know this was recorded ahead of uh, Jeff and I's journey um, into the, the belly of the beast in Pensacola. Um, but, yeah, I feel I feel confident. I feel like we're going to do a good job. I've never really done one of these before. But I feel like I could just sit there and ask ask for questions. I don't know that I have like a speech prepared, um, so I'll probably just say what I've seen from practice. Try to keep that to three to five minutes, and then open it up for what what I assume will just be an absolute barrage of questions. Yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. Thursday's practice a little bit shorter than most. Probably makes sense. I assume Friday will be a little bit more of a vigorous physical practice. And then they'll taper it off Saturday to get ramped back up for their mock game on Sunday. Uh, a lot of special team stuff. Roll up a little, midway through practice. Uh, you can see the updates from Ira, who's there the whole time, with Austin Cox uh, on the scene the entire time. When I got there, I only saw, I think, one drive of 11 on 11 uh, with Jordan, and it went nowhere, kind of in a hurry. Uh, mm. But, you know, I guess one of the, the – Bright spots, I guess, depending on where you're at right now, is as they were getting ready to snap the ball, Jordan, I think, called a check, but then the defense, like, diagnosed it immediately, and they all did their little gesture symbol to signal what they thought was coming, and they, they read it. I mean, it, okay. there's nothing there going go. on there. So they're they're learning to read and diagnose these things quicker. So either you think, ah, the offense, why aren't they able to do anything? But it's like, hey, the defense, maybe the defense is figuring it out. So that's always, you know. The, the give and take of all this. I just I don't know what to think, Corey. Again, I think we talked a little bit about it on the program uh, Wednesday on the live show that we use for Thursday's podcast. But just being able to watch practice and then you kind of know what's coming and then you feel good about certain things. But then you're like, well, it's, you know, we're not going up against the team we're playing. You know, we're going up against the, the uh, defense that might not have been a very strong point. It wasn't a strong point last year. So it's kind of hard to still work through all that. Uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to find my 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 bearings here as I try to dial in and get a little more optimistic as we close in on the the opener. Okay, buddy. Well, good luck with that, man. I hope you find some optimism. You know what, Aslan? You know we're still we're still breathing air. We College football is right around the corner. Yeah, dude. I guess this weekend, Illinois yeah. and somebody Nebraska, maybe Nebraska. Yeah. yeah, go Big Red. All right. I'm psyched. Let's go. I didn't realize we're so close to it. I, was, I thought we were going to be like kind of the, the opening. Well, even with that not be, even if that game wasn't happening, I'll be honest, I might not watch that. I don't. I mean, I'm a college football fan, but I mean, I'm a that big a college football fan. 
to watch Nebraska, Illinois. But, um, you know, just the fact that the real season starts, uh, what are we, eight days away now? Right from the real season and nine days away from Florida State? Is that what we're, yeah, right? Sure. Yeah. 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 So uh, we're Peter Warwick days away from Florida State playing, and we're, uh, you know, Corey Sawyer days away from uh from the actual real season starting with uh, Miami Alabama Georgia Clemson it's gonna be a it's here man we made it almost I don't want to jinx it we've we've almost made it and I got to start diving into Notre Dame game prep did see on Thursday that uh, one of their starting linebackers is going to be out for the season after a lower leg injury Maris Liafu if I botched that I apologize Maris um didn't really have that great of a season last year, but he was slated to be one of their starting linebackers. But he was a true freshman last year, so I think he fell in that sort of Dix Lundy thing where you, you thought the upshot was going to be quite strong. Closed out the season strong last year, though graded out at over 80% in his tackling versus Clemson and Alabama. Um, yeah, I think he's a guy that they – yeah, he didn't – I think he started a couple of games for them last year in, in like an emergency role, but he was a guy they were counting on to be the will, I think, like – this was his. This was his year. I think he'd been talked up a lot in camp as uh, one of the most impressive guys of the camp so far, and he was definitely going to start. And they uh, they lost him. I, I thought it was funny. Not funny. Well, it is funny. Um, you know the way Notre Dame does practice. They wouldn't. They wouldn't admit like they had to get sources. Lower leg. Uh, lower body injury. Wouldn't even say leg. Oh. Lower body injury. We could confirm that he suffered a major low. This is a media outlet saying this. We can confirm he suffered a major lower body injury Wednesday at practice. We will be able to ask Brian Kelly about it on Monday. <laughs> Man, I mean, I, I know Notre Dame isn't begging for fans, but uh, I mean, good grief. There, there's like no information that comes out of some of these places. Monday, like they go a full week without talking to the head coach oh. and maybe not talking to anyone. Like, so they, they act like they couldn't really confirm it, how serious it was, until they talked to Brian Kelly uh, four days from now. So, yeah. Anyway. According to Blue and Gold Illustrated, Liafu's absence, a meaningful loss for the Notre Dame defense. The Irish are now without one of their rising defensive playmakers. Kelly and defense coordinator Marcus Freeman, though, have identified five players that make up their primary linebacker rotation. So, mm, um, okay. Hey, well, you know, you'll take what you can get. You know, don't want anybody to get hurt, obviously, but uh, maybe this opens up some of that quick passing game on the, uh, you know, between the hashes. Get the ball out of Jordan or McKenzie's hand quickly. Uh, get them a little bit mixed up. So that's that's what's going on here. Florida State maintains uh, their health. I still think they're they're fairly healthy. Uh, maybe we'll get some more clarification from Mike Norvell when we speak to him later on this week. I don't know if we get him after Friday's practice or not. I should probably pull that up on the schedule, but I don't. Uh, nonetheless, let's go to some of these questions that we have here. Not a lot of them. Again, it's my fault. Didn't post uh, post the thread until pretty much an hour before we went on air here doing this. But nonetheless, some of these guys, they rise to the occasion. Guys like Mark. Mark in Naples. Wake up! Got my game tickets and my flight booked for the Notre Dame game. Staying in college town with my older son should be a great boys trip. Guys trip. Come on, man. We'll try to drop by for at least one of the war champ parties. Okay, please do so. Please do so. Yeah, you better. What else are you doing, Mark? Yeah, yeah, Come on, man. Uh, to me, probably golfing. Uh, to me, Mark says, a big factor in this Notre Dame game will be field position and execution on special plays. Maybe special teams, special plays. By the way, this team's pretty confident, Corey. They were drilling uh, onside kick recovery. So they're okay. expecting teams you know, to want to, to wanna need, need to get the ball back one more time. So it's crazy that the amount of detail that goes into these things, but we've, we've talked about that a little bit. Both teams will likely make some big plays on offense and score some points. Both teams will likely run the ball with success, so I'm looking at Norvell's historical success with special teams as a X factor. Hmm. We have been awful in recent years at kick returns. Kicking and punting hasn't been great since either Aguayo and Graham Gano. Have you seen improvement in special teams at practice? Do you expect our special teams unit to make an impact? Any kick returners standing out in practice who could break a big play? Boy, do I miss Greg Reed. Anyway, hope to see you next weekend. Let's do this. Start 1-0, baby. Okay. Well read, Aslan. That was well read. Thank you. Uh, yes, special teams. I feel like you captured Mark's essence. I tried to. I tried to. 
Punting has been great. I know you, y'all can laugh, snicker, whatever you want to do. Uh, Alex Mastromano, like, mishit a punt on Thursday, and it still went 45 yards in the air. Yeah, he uh, punts it weird. Like, um, it, he he punts a lot of end over end. Is that just a new a new trend in football to punt it end over end? Because they go high. You know, we grew up our whole lives when you, you the punters want to get a spiral because yes. they go far. They they go farther uh, clearly. But he punts it in over end, and it's still going forty to forty five yards. But it's much higher and angled better. But it's still going forty to forty five. So that. I'm interested to know when they say, hey, man, unleash the spiral, because he's done that too. But also just give us a 41-yarder high with no return. Yeah. Because you, you'll you take either one of those. And I think the 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 um, the end over end one really comes into play when you're trying to pin a team deep, like inside the 10. Uh, that that seems to work really well. It takes more of a natural bounce. Uh, the guys can get you know between it and the goal line and know that a bounce is probably coming their way. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to see, though, because like, I don't – you know, if a kid punted it end over end 10 years ago, it was like a third grader. Like, oh, no, 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 that's not how you kick it, man. But now it's like that's what he's doing, and I assume other punters in the country are doing it. But, yeah, yeah he's been pretty good. Yeah, Reggie Roby doesn't grow on trees. It's hard to hit, boom it with a spiral, so you got to Oh, gotta Reggie Roby, nice. Strong, strong. So, uh, in terms of kick return, um, – I Who still knows? Don't, yeah, I, I just they're they're trying guys back there. I've never been a big guy of like the, the whole like all right, the guys are running back, we'll put him back there. Like you need, there's a certain knack you need to have for returning kicks. I don't know if they have any of that. Uh, punt return is still probably Travis Jay's one of the guys that we've been seeing out there consistently. Corey Wren's been back there on kick returns. He's shown ability. Uh, it's been inconsistent. It's been a bit up and down, uh, but. You know, again, they got eight days to, to clean some of this stuff up. But they, they're they punting great. To Corey's point, the end-over-end on end, over end stuff, I mean, he's pinning guys. He's booming them. I mean, he can flip field position. He can uh, pin them in their own side of the field. So that's that's definitely the, the high mark of the camp, I would say, at least definitely from a special teams perspective. Kicking. Let's hope. Yeah, let's hope that's not the high mark of the whole camp yeah. in, in totality as the punter. Um I will say he's never punted in front of 75,000 people. Yeah, um, I know he punted college in college before last year, but, I mean, it's a whole different ball game when it's 75,000 as opposed to 12. Um, so we'll see how he handles that his first time through. I don't want you guys yelling at us and shooting arrows at us if he, if he has six punts for a 39-yard average. It's in there. Try, at least we know it's in there. At least we know there is the ability to hit. He hit one, like Aslan said the other day, he hit one like 57 yards angle towards the corner this was a spiral uh he just air yards them. yeah air yards like, yeah. no no i'm counting from the line of scrimmage it was a 57 yard punt um i mean so he, he hit it 70 yards in the air i mean he bombed it um so he, yeah he's got a leg so it's just a matter of him getting that experience playing in front of all those people uh, as far as the returners though it's hard to tell you if they're doing well or not because they don't they're not live you know, they, they work a lot more, and it makes sense. They work a lot more on the blocking formations. Yeah. And getting the block the blockers are contacting each other. They're making contact with the with the, the defenders and the gunners. They're they're actually popping pads and trying to work on that, but they're not like going live with the returners. So we don't know really who they've been impressed with or how you could even judge which one's the guy you want, which one's got the special stuff back there because they're not really tackling, at least the, the parts that we've seen. Maybe they do it in the scrimmage, but in the uh, the practices, they're not tackling these guys. They're not even really trying to tackle these guys. Um, so it's hard to know um, who's leading the way at returner. But, you know, if you block it up well enough, Corey Wren would be a nice guy to have back there. When it comes to salads, the fresher, the better. That's why at Zaxby's, we don't make your salad until you order it. Try our brand new Southwest salad with fire roasted corn, juicy tomatoes, crispy Santa Fe tortilla strips, and our new Southwest ranch dressing. It's big enough to fill you up without weighing you down. The new Southwest salad. Get it fresh, get it customized, get it made to order. For a limited time, only at your neighborhood Zaxby's. And don't forget to listen in for the Zaxby's indescribably good player of the week every Monday on Wake Up War Chan. S. Quinn 67. Wake up. Getting pumped for FSU football. 
As of the writing of this, we are Derek Brooks days away from kickoff. Bringing the family down from North Carolina for the game, my wife graduated from FSU also, and the kids are excited. The shows have been especially good over the last few weeks. Keep bringing it. Black Burt and I hope to make it to one of those listener appreciation events over the weekend. All right, come on out, y'all. My question for the week is, based on the quality of offensive line play, if our running backs are able to run the ball well and accumulate over 150 yards rushing versus Notre Dame, not including whatever Jordan Travis perhaps contributes, will you guys raise your win total prediction for the year? Go Knowles, class of 93, Esquin 67. That's a good class to be a part of. Um yeah, I mean, well, look, man, if they ran for if the running backs ran for 150 yards against Notre Dame, and let's say Jordan Travis adds another, I mean, Jordan Travis is a wild card. He could he could run for 130, he could run for 60. Um, if if it's just your running backs getting those kind of yards against Notre Dame, um, yeah, that would mean your offensive line played pretty darn well. And I think maybe that that ticks off another win for me. No matter how the game goes against Notre Dame. I think, okay, maybe you have a better shot against another team down the line that I didn't think you did. Because if you're doing that in the first game, you would hope it's going to progress. And maybe the if the offensive line could actually be decent to in the running game, can average 200 yards a game-ish, uh, yeah, man, you, you should win some games. You, I, I would I, That would, that would uh, bolster my thoughts on the season a little bit if the running backs can gain 150 yards by themselves against a, a defense like Notre Dame's. Yeah, I would. I mean, if you're at 150, and I mean, either of those. I mean, all three of the quarterbacks that are kind of in the mix. I don't. I don't really think Tate is. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you get 150 out of your running backs, and then whatever you get on top of that from Jordan Travis or McKenzie or Chuba, that's probably that's a little bit of a recipe for an upset. So that would you know put me on the side of seven for your win loss prediction. So yeah, I, I would do that. Um, but it makes you feel better about every like if you're if you're running like last year I know they ran for whatever they ran for 160 yards or whatever it was against Notre Dame I keep forgetting that number but Jordan Travis had 60 percent of it if you're talking about running for 200 yards in 150 of those running backs well you know what kind of weapons you have at quarterback and I just think man that that changes everything if you're not having to depend on a quarterback's legs for your rushing yardage and he's more of just an added bonus, especially if it's that guy, because it's a real big bonus. Man, that's that's a terror for defenses. I mean, that that's that's a real good sign that your offensive line played well against a stout front. Like Notre Dame lost some guys on the offensive line. Their defensive line is legit. So if you're putting up those kind of yards against that team, and this is a purely hypothetical, I really, I, I, I do think the offensive line will be better. I would be stunned if the running backs had that many yards. But if they did, yeah, man, that means... You can run on anyone. And if you can run on anyone, you can beat almost anyone, save for the team in South Carolina. So, yeah, that would, that would, uh, that would, uh, yeah, like I said, just encourage me a little bit that, that the offense could be something really, uh, really good. 153 yards as a team, 69 yards from the running backs. Webb, right. Corbin, and Toe feeling. So you're more than doubling that. And imagine the Notre Dame game last year if you would have gotten an extra 80 yards out of your running backs. Well, that's a, at least, what, one more touchdown? And maybe one less touchdown for them. You know, yeah, because you have the ball from, longer. Yeah, yeah uh, so, yeah, man, that's a – if you can have a running game that's like top 15 or 20 in the country, top two in the ACC, yeah, that's a, that's a recipe. Frosty Frog. Is Mike Norvell scheduling another scrimmage as part of the preparation for Notre Dame this weekend? Practice reports over the last few days having conveyed intense preparations. I know he backs off practice leading up to his scrimmage. Yeah, they're doing a what they've put on the schedule for the media as a mock game Sunday. It will not be open to us. I, I don't even know if they're going to talk to us on Sunday, to be honest with you. I don't know where my phone's at. I don't have the schedule in front of me. I don't, I don't think they have any availability listed on there for Sunday, but... I would say Thursday was a deload day, if we mm. want to use the cool uh, new nomenclature. I would assume that they'll probably get after it on Friday. I mean, they weren't – I think they were just in shells, if I'm not mistaken, on Thursday. I would think that maybe Friday they'll ramp it up a little bit and then probably, t again, you know, taper it off Saturday to, to get ready for 
what's going to be probably the the full dress rehearsal. I mean, they're calling it a mock game, and I think they did the same thing before Georgia Tech, where it's like yeah, they'll they'll put the time on the clock. They'll have the offense come out and start warming up the way they would before the the Notre Dame game. I'm sure they're probably going to do it at night as well uh, to to simulate you know the circadian rhythms and all that kind of stuff. So. Yeah, there. This it hasn't been a laissez-faire, uh, lethargic effort, man. Uh, there's somebody. There's a little chirping going on from one of the leaders on the offense today, saying like, you know, come on, urgency, urgency. And then somebody yelled, "Yeah, man, tell them." Uh, but it was a go. special teams practice, by and large. So it's hard to really stay, you know, totally amped up the entire time. But yeah, man, they're they're not taking it lightly. I just looked it up, Aslan, uh, yep. while you were talking. We we reversed uh, roles there. Oh, look at that! Uh, you went on and on, and I and I looked something up. That's how we. It's like it's good that we can adjust on the fly like we know that. Each, we know each other now. We know. Um, each other. So no, we do not get Norvell on Friday. We get Chris Thompson um, and student athletes. By the way, folks, I looked it up. I might have missed one or two, but so far, just in August, we have talked to forty-one different players, and every coach besides Chris Thompson, who are who we are getting on Friday. Um, that's incredible. It's just amazing. So I hope you guys are going to our YouTube page, watching these videos, getting to know the players you cheer for. It's a really neat uh, aspect of the Florida State program. So hopefully they win too. I know that's that's usually the most important thing, but I, I think that's really cool that we've gotten you know half the roster um, already, and we're going to get three or four more kids. Like to, who, who we get on Thursday, Aslan, Justin, uh, George, Joshua Farmer, Joshua Farmer, George Wilson, and Maurice Smith. Like, look, Wilson and Farmer probably aren't going to play a ton. Uh, we got uh, Malcolm Ray on Wednesday, probably not going to play a ton, but we're getting every player, um, which is just neat, man. It's it's good it's good experience for them because eventually some of those guys will be players, and they'll they'll, they'll be more comfortable with that in that role. But also, yeah, it's awesome for you guys to get to know the players. So anyway, get Chris Thompson on Friday. We do get Norvell on Saturday after that practice. And then Sunday is no availability. And they call it a mock game, but I think it's more like a walkthrough, right? No, man. I think this is – I think that's it. That's going to be I don't a mock think, game game, man. They're going no, I, I think of, because it's not the, – the other ones were termed scrimmages. Scrimmage close, scrimmage close. Mock game to me is like – all the administrative stuff, like knowing who to look for, uh, knowing where you're supposed to be on third down if you're the punt unit, getting used to a TV timeout, getting used to a touchdown and then going on for the extra point, all that stuff that you want to go over. Um, so so when the game comes on Sunday night, it's not uh, something completely new and different. So what is I it going to lack then? What's it lacking that you think is going to I don't think it'll be like – I mean, they might do some 11-on-11. 11 11. They might, I don't think it's going to be like we're tackling Ja'Shawn Corbin 10 times. We're going we're gonna to throw Treshawn, Treshawn Ward out. I think it'll be more of like working – I mean, you can do an 11-on-11 11 11, but, but thud up and shell up. But I really do think it's more like the coaches will be in the box for the first time maybe, the communi- working on the communication between Dillingham and Norvell and Fuller and Papuchis and everybody else. I think, I think that's what they kind of want to do with a mock game. Um, it's not just about competing and who's won the job because I think at this point they know yeah. who, who their guys are. It is, it is interesting looking at the schedule. Like every day it lists 9 a.m. practice, 10.45 uh, interviews, 9 a.m. practice, 10.45 interviews. But Saturday, they're going to start a little bit later, 45 minutes later, but they're going to end an hour 15 later than they usually do. So it's going to be like a 30-minute longer practice than usual. Yeah, so it looks Saturday. like Saturday is the, the big practice. That, yeah. That's going to be probably a, the, maybe the last physical preseason-type practice they have. And then the Sunday, and they don't even list the time on Sunday that they're doing anything. Yeah. Um, and there's no availability anyway, so it doesn't matter. But my my thought is they're going to probably do it Pretty late. At, they're going to probably start at seven on Sunday night. Yeah. I so they get completely used to what what that time of day feels like in August because that's when the that's when the real game will start a week later. Corey Jordan Travis's health. It's my question on the Running Express. Is it the okay. front of your mind or the back of your mind? I was talking to Ira about like it's it's really easy to romanticize the thing about how good Jordan Travis could be when we factor like when we kind of eliminate the bad and we just focus on the on the positive that we've seen from him uh, this preseason this spring and also the the high marks of his uh, 2020 season uh, you can't live fearful and scared or anything like that but 
Like, is that something that you you don't worry about? Like, when you're factoring in win loss numbers or what this team could look like if he's the one that ultimately wins a job, or is that something that figures into your calculus at, like at all times when we're talking about him? Uh, yeah, I think that's always something when you're talking about what he could be or what kind of season he could have if he's the starter that you have to keep in the back of your mind is that there there has been no indication. Again, small sample size, but you know he was hurt last spring. He, I think the one day before COVID shut everything down, he wasn't throwing at all. They come back, he gets hurt again in August, is out for basically the entire preseason, uh, has to rally up to play against Jacksonville State because he didn't even practice at all that week, leads them to a win, seems relatively healthy, gets banged up again against North Carolina, uh, gets banged up at the end of the Notre Dame game, then gets banged up again against North Carolina, then isn't himself really against Louisville, gets hurt against Pitt and has to come out of the game, and then, you know, he wasn't, I can't, he didn't play against NC State. I don't know if he was going to play against Clemson or not. Um, we'll never know, Dabo. Sorry, man. We will never know. I hope that flight was awesome, though. Um, and then, uh, so, it, yeah, man, it's not like it was just, like, even Chubba. Like, I made fun of the, you know, him crashing through a glass table and then sep- the collarbone thing and it couldn't get right. But that was, like, one major injury that he just couldn't over, like it just kept flaring up. These were a bunch of different things with Jordan Travis, which, which always gives you pause, right? Yeah. It's not like a guy just, oh, he is neat. It's not like Derwin James, right? Like Derwin James has definitely proven that he's a little bit injury prone, but they aren't nicks and bruises that keep him out for a game here or there. Right. With Jordan Travis, right. you he's out for the season, but you never know, at least last year, you didn't know, okay, is he healthy enough to play this week? It's not a season ender. But he, can he play this week? And if he can play, what percentage is he at? How uh, how good will he be? What kind of performance will you get from him? That's what you – I think when you move forward with Jordan Travis, if he's healthy, he's a I – th- I just think he's a good college quarterback. If he's banged up in any way, though, and limited, he isn't. So th- that's why you always – when you talk about what he can be, because of the various injuries every week that we saw with him, it's hard to get um, – you know, overly excited about his potential until he has a season maybe where that doesn't happen. And again, that might be unfair. It might have been just a confluence of a bunch of crazy things that happened in the span of eight months you know, during the season, the span of three months. But they did happen, so it makes sense to worry about it. I would just think about, it's a little bit different, it's not quite apples to apples, but just think about like Frank Gore. So I think Frank Gore blew out both of his knees, or at least one knee twice when he was in college. Yeah, and then he goes on and has a Hall of Fame career in the NFL. Like, there's, there's no way. I was like, there's no way he's gonna make it in the NFL. Like, no way possible. And is he still playing? He might. Did he play last year? I think he played last year, you but know? I think that was it. Man, who knows, man? He might play till he's fifty. Yeah, I don't but he's know. going to Cooper's. Not Cooper's. Not, he's going to Canton. Hey, uh, he can go to Cooperstown too. He can go it's open. Yeah, it's anybody can go. Well, <laughs> yeah. he's gonna be enshrined in it. Um, so yeah, that's, um, you know, as things start kind of crystallizing around that position, that was one of the things I was wondering, talking about to Ira as we were watching practice, because there was a lot of punting, a lot of punting going on, a lot of wedges, a lot of gunners, right. a lot of punting. And it's like, okay, um, I get the gist of this. Like, it's nice that you made it out there, buddy. I, I decided not to, I had a deload day myself Well, I mean, on Thursday morning, I, I knew I was going to have a long night, a Thursday night, big drive back and to and fro. Um, and so, yeah, I was like, I'm not going to go out there and watch a special teams practice. Um, but you guys were there. Ira was there. So that was nice. And I still wrote a story. I wrote a story from, uh, Odell's interview and, and talking about, uh, Notre Dame a little bit. So, uh, yeah. So I, I tried to do my part before I, I went on the big journey to Pensacola. Odell feels good about his guys. And he's not one to just like offer up, you know, flippant remarks yeah. just for, just for the sake of doing it. So. That's something we should all hang on right now. They're breaking a new offensive line. These guys might be able to find some cracks in the armor for them. You hope, man. You hope. I, I you know, I, I think the defensive line could be a strength if it's healthy. But man, if you, if some guys start going down for weeks at a time, it, the, just the depth really concerns you. No. Um, God bless Malcolm Ray. We have no idea what he is. None. Um, and there's other, there's, there's these other guys that just haven't, you know, they lost Griffiths, not that he was going to, it didn't seem like he was, you know, flying up the depth chart. Um, but they just don't have a ton of bodies that have proven anything other than those top five guys. And Dennis Briggs really hasn't proven anything. He's just been good in camp. So really you're talking about Cooper, Lovett, um, Jermaine Johnson and Keir Thomas. Lovett really honestly hasn't 
he wasn't very good last year. He looks a lot different this year. He might be legit this year. So might Dennis Briggs. But I can understand the trepidation of people not believing it until they see it. And what do you have behind those guys? It's just not a ton of uh, um, experience, depth, or maybe even talented depth. We don't know what those guys are at all. Love it graded out at 63.3 last year. Um, had a couple of 70s, 76 versus Pitt, 72 versus Jacksonville State, 36 versus Louisville. Um, but, I mean, Odell didn't He's mention He's in that. shape. He's yeah. in shape now, right? Well, yeah. that's the thing. That's what Odell mentioned. Like, the most important thing for him is, like, he needs you to be able to be in condition. Like, you have to be able to strike a blocker and get after it more than just once. That's that's no good for him. So, uh, hopefully these guys – because, yeah, they do need to be in really good condition because I think that, to your point, the depth – is not there. I mean, there's there's no there's no proven depth. I mean, so if it's if it's not proven, can you really even call it depth? Do you like what they have for the for the front four, and then being able to bring a guy like Briggs yeah. in to to give a, a blow to to Coop and um, and love it. Was well, as, as they were walking off the practice field, I mean, just you know, talking about conditioning. Like I heard uh, Quayshawn Fuller said when he first got here, he weighed three oh three or three oh five. Like Quayshawn Fuller, and he's a DN. Yeah. And like, what is think, he now? I mean, he's got seventy. I think he's like in the two sixties. Yeah. So, you know, it takes all of us a little bit of time to figure these things out. But you know, the defensive line doesn't have a. a Does lot that of time happen at Alabama? Yeah. Do like, do they have kids that just come in forty five pounds overweight? I know last year was different, uh, but Biscuit, we love you, but uh, well, he came here Mark- at nineteen though. You know, no, that's true. The, right. So it's like, do, does he's that six, happen? He's 265 right now. He's 265. They have him in, last, in this, even in the spring, I feel like he was 300. Really? Like, I think, I, I mean, he was close, man. I think he's lost at least 25 pounds since the spring. Marquiston Douglas. Oh, I'm talking oh, about. oh, oh Biscuit, yeah. Good. Yeah. So I'm that's what I'm saying. Fuller. Like, is that when those guys get to Alabama, are they like, oh, I'm sorry, coach. I'm a little bit heavy. I'm 33 pounds overweight. I mean, does Saban just say, if you show up 33 pounds overweight, I don't want to see you for two years? Like, are you gone? Take Go to Vanderbilt? Like, I, how does I, – maybe it happens at every school. I'm sure it even happened at Florida – I know it happened at Florida State back in the day. But, man, it just seems like in this day and age, you know, DJ Williams came into camp 15 pounds overweight uh, this spring. Why? Come on, guys. This is your livelihood. This is, could be your career. You could change your family's – uh, generationally, uh, if if you do well here and, and play in the league, why you, why are you hamstringing yourself by coming in overweight? I don't know. I'm sure it goes. I know it goes on all over the country. It just seems like there's been a few of those the last few years at Florida State. Well, that, what was that guy? Terrence Cody, Mount Cody played for Saban, but he was like 360, but he somehow made it work. So it's like even when you're overweight, uh, yeah, little- he just <laughs> happens to be like the best fat player in college football history. You know what I mean? Like him and Craig Hayward. Like it just yeah he's three hundred ninety pounds but he he actually just moves people out of the way and becomes a weapon yeah that's I guess that's how it works in Tuscaloosa. All right, that's a wrap for us here on Wake Up War Chant. Jeff Cameron show goes one to three p.m. on War Chant TV and over the airwaves at ninety three three FM in Tallahassee. We'll be back out of practice on Friday. Uh, we will post updates. We'll get the interviews from Coach Thompson and selected players, and then Saturday we'll have. Uh, Norvell and players, all that at warchant.com. Probably have some other video feature coming up. Uh, Keep your eyes peeled for all that sort of stuff. We're still grinding, even though the weekend is quickly approaching for us. Have a great one, everybody. He's Cora Maslow. Thanks for listening to Wake Up War Champ, fueled by DeLuna Coffee. Come explore our world of coffee. DeLuna Coffee features over two dozen different blends. DeLuna's unique roasts can be delivered ground finely for drip coffee makers, coarse for the craft crowd, untouched as a whole bean, or even in convenient K-cups. Founded in 2014 by the Lemix family, Ed and Brett are FSU alums and boosters who are extending a special offer to all listeners. Use the promo code WARCHANT15 for a 15% discount. Visit DeLunaCoffee.com and check out their Facebook and Instagram.